Hello, and welcome to Extrema on an Interval. My name is Tuesday Jay Johnson. I'm a lecturer at the University of Texas, El Paso, and an assistant professor at Doniana Community College. This particular lecture is for Math 1411 Calculus at UTEP. Applications of differentiation comes from Chapter 3 of Larson's 11th edition Calculus, Section 3.1, Extrema on an Interval. So what is extrema? I'm using this word all the time, so what is it? Let f be defined on an interval i containing c, and f, of course, is a function. f of c is the minimum of f on i if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the interval. And remember, this interval is just, it's just some interval. We sometimes call this a neighborhood because it's close. It's relatively close to the x value. f of c is the maximum on of f on i if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in this interval. Now the minimum and maximum of a function on an interval are the extreme values, and in plural we say extrema of the function on the interval. The minimum and maximum of a function on an interval are also called the absolute minimum and absolute maximum, or global minimum and global maximum on and the, the interval. So minimums and maximums, we call them extreme values. We could also call them relative or absolute maximums and minimums. <clears throat> so here's the extreme value theorem. The extreme value theorem says, if f is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, then f has both a minimum and a maximum on the interval. And it could be that that maximum is at an end point or the minimum is at an end point or maybe even both. Or it could be that the maximum occurs and the minimum occurs somewhere in between the endpoints. But it's very important that first of all f is continuous and it's on a closed interval. If that happens, guaranteed that this function has both a minimum and a maximum on the interval. So I mentioned relative extrema. If there's an open interval containing c on which f of c is a maximum, then f of c is called the relative maximum of f. Or you can say that f has a relative maximum at the point c comma f of c. If there's an open interval containing c on which f of c is a minimum, then f of c is called a relative minimum or of f. Or you can say that f has a relative minimum at the point c comma f of c. And remember, this is like the neighborhood, right? This is your little neighborhood store. We're not talking about the entire city you live in. Like in town, maybe they're not the richest people, but in your neighborhood, they're the richest people. That would be the maximum. Or, you know, somebody's got to have fewer cars than everybody else. So we maybe have a minimum in your neighborhood, but that's different than the minimum within the city you live. A uh, little bit of grammar here. The plural of relative maximum is relative maxima. And the plural of relative minimum is relative minima, so extrema, maxima, minima, we'll use these terms. Relative maximum and relative minimum are sometimes called local maximums and local minimum, respectively. And that's just the whole idea of the neighborhood, it's just local rather than relative. It's relative to your location, so it's local. Critical numbers. Now, critical numbers I have a, a separate lecture on, you can find it on my YouTube channel. It's called critical numbers. And it goes into more detail, a few more examples. But for now, we can get at this. The definition. Let f be defined at c. If f prime of c equals zero, or if f is not differentiable at c, then c is a critical number of f. Something important happens at this c value if the derivative is zero, or if the derivative does not exist. And we have a theorem that follows from this definition. And it says, if f has a relative minimum or a relative maximum at x equals c, then c is a critical number of f. That is, relative extrema occur only at critical numbers. So that's why they're critical. They tell us something important. It tells us where we have relative extrema. So this theorem tells us to find rel relative extrema, we need to find where the derivative is zero or the derivative does not exist. So here's some guidelines. To find extrema of a continuous function f on a closed interval from a to b, we're going to use the following steps. First, find the critical numbers of f in the open interval from a to b. Uh, note these are x values where the derivative is zero or does not exist, right? Critical numbers. 
Step two, evaluate F at each critical number that you found in step one. Step three, very important, evaluate F at each end point of the closed interval. The least of these values is the minimum, the greatest is the maximum. Don't overthink it. Let's look at some examples. So find the derivative of the function at the indicated extremum. First of all, take a function like f of x equals cosine of pi x over 2 at the point 0 comma 1 and at the point 2 comma negative 1. The derivative of f is, well this is the cosine of pi over 2x. So we're going to use the chain rule. The derivative of cosine is negative sine leave the inside alone, so I'll have pi x over 2 inside the sine, and then I'm going to multiply by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside is the pi over 2, and I have it rewritten as negative pi over 2 times the sine of pi x over 2. I can now evaluate the derivative at the point 0 comma 1. All I really need is that the derivative at 0 is 0, and at 2 if I put 2 in for x, 2 pi over 2 simplifies to be pi. The derivative at 2 is also a 0. So derivative of 0 at the extrema makes sense. If we look at the graph, of course we're going to have extrema at those values. Find the derivative of the function at the indicated extremum. So we know that these are extreme values. We're going to find the derivative. We want to verify that the derivative is zero or undefined. So taking our function f of x equals negative 3x times the square root of x plus 1. Now, this is a product rule, right? Negative 3x times, so multiplied by product rule. Negative 3x times the derivative of my radical, and that's 1 half, leave the inside alone, x plus 1. Subtract 1 from the exponent, so that's a negative 1 half. Don't forget the derivative of the inside on something like this. You could forget about the 1 and it works out, but in general, don't forget about the derivative of the inside. So that's first derivative of the second plus second, the square root of x plus 1, times the derivative of the first. And our first portion of this function is the negative 3x, derivative negative 3. If I simplify my 2 from the 1 half and my x plus 1 that's underneath a radical will both be in the denominator because of the negative 1 half power. The negative 3x times 1 in our numerator and with the coefficient of minus 3 our radical follows. And minus 3 times the square root of x plus 1. I have the derivative, now I'm going to evaluate it. For our given derivative at negative 1 comma 0 I want to evaluate f prime of negative 1 negative 3 times negative 1 over 2 square root of negative 1 plus 1 minus 3 times the square root of negative 1 plus 1. Well, this is 0. Negative 3 times the square root of 0, that's 0. But our problem is we also have a 0 in the denominator. The fraction has a 0 in the denominator and a non-zero numerator, so it's not an indeterminate form. The derivative is undefined at negative 1. So this is a critical number. The derivative is not defined. Also a critical number. If I put in negative two-thirds, and I just forgot to write the negative there, I fortunately used it correctly. Put a negative, ugly looking negative, but it's there. At negative two-thirds, if I evaluate it negative two-thirds, it's not very pretty. It's the square root of one-third in a couple of places. The two simplify, but the square root of one-third is the square root of 3 over 3. Uh, if, it's, if it's the reciprocal of the square root of 3 over 3, it is the square root of 3. And we simplify, it ends up we have a derivative of 0. Check my calculations, make sure I'm right, make sure you can verify that step algebraically. Quotient rule of radicals along with a little reciprocal action here. Alright, so very rarely are we given a function and told, hey, here's some extrema, verify it. So we have to be able to find what these extrema are on our own. So let's locate the absolute extrema of the function on the closed interval. And our function is given by f of x equals 2x plus 5 all over 3 on the closed interval from 0 to 5. This is a continuous function. In fact, it's a linear function. You can tell by the way we've rewritten it here. 2x over 3 is 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds continuous on my domain, 
my derivative, f prime of x is 2 thirds. I know it has absolute extrema, and on this closed interval, think about what's going on. This derivative is always defined, and it's never zero, right? It's always 2 thirds. What do I conclude? The only possible extrema is at the endpoints. Right? There's no place the derivative does not exist. There's no place the derivative is zero, no critical numbers. The only possible extrema is at the endpoints, so I evaluate f of zero, which happens to be 5 thirds, and f of 5, if I put 5 in for x, 10 plus 5 is 15, divided by 3 is 5. Which number is the biggest? 5. So that's going to be our maximum at the point 5, comma 5. Which number is our smallest? Oh, 5 thirds. So that's going to be our minimum at the point 0, comma 5 thirds. Think about this. It's a linear function on an interval with a positive slope. Of course, the minimum will be on the left endpoint and the maximum will be on the right endpoint. Hopefully we get a few more examples that are not just linear functions. Well, here we go. f of x equals x cubed minus 12x on the interval from 0 to 4. I want to locate the absolute extrema of the function. I know that every polynomial is continuous on its domain, so it's continuous here. So I know extrema exist. My derivative is 3x squared minus 12. This also is a polynomial. The derivative is a polynomial. And so the derivative exists everywhere. So I check where the derivative is equal to 0 for my critical numbers. I'm going to add 12, divide by 3 to get x squared equals 4. I know that when x squared equals 4, it must be that x equals plus or minus 2. So I'm going to check my endpoints, 0 and 4. I'm going to check my critical numbers, 2 and negative 2. And I put them in this order for a reason, as we'll see. f of 0 is 0 f of 2, 2 cubed is 8, however 12 times 2 is 24, and 8 minus 24 is a negative 16. f of 4, my other endpoint value, put 4 in, 4 cubed is 64, minus 48 gives me a positive 16, and f of negative 2, negative 2 not, is not in my interval. While it is a critical number of the function, it's not a critical number of the function on this interval. So I don't care. I don't care what f of negative 2 is. It doesn't count. My end caps are in green. Critical numbers in between them, I put in red. So what's the largest number of 0, negative 16, and 16? 16 is. That's the maximum. All right. Now, maximum can't also be minimum now, can it? Some functions it can. 0 and negative 16. Negative 16 is smallest, so that's the minimum. 0. Fantastic. It's not a maximum or a minimum. And this is not in the interval. If g of x equals the cube root of x on the interval from negative 1 to 1, first I'm going to rewrite it as x to the 1 third. So I can take the derivative, 1 third, x to the negative 2 thirds. And I will rewrite this with a positive exponent in radical form. Now I know this derivative is never 0. And it's never 0 because if I set a rational expression equal to 0, my first step is to multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator. And when I multiply anything times 0, I'll end up with numerator equals 0. But this numerator is never going to be 0. It's 1. The derivative is, however, undefined at 0. So I'm going to check my endpoints, g of negative 1, my critical number, g of 0, and my right-hand endpoint, g of 1. I see that negative 1 is the smallest, positive 1 is the largest, minimums and maximums, and g of 0 is a critical number. Something important happens here because the derivative is undefined, but it doesn't happen to be a maximum or a minimum. Example 4. h of t equals t over t minus 2 on the interval from 3 to 5. Keep in mind, that h of t is not continuous at t equals 2, but 2 is not in our interval, so we don't care. Find the derivative. The derivative, using the quotient rule, is t minus 2, so low, derivative of high, derivative of t is 1, minus high, t, times the derivative of t minus 2, which is 1, all over t minus 2 squared. Tempting to cancel these, but remember this portion doesn't also have a t minus 2, so we simplify our numerator first t minus 2 minus t, leave the denominator as t minus 2 all squared, and my numerator simplifies to be negative 2 over our given denominator. I know this derivative is never 0 because the numerator can never be 0. 
I know that this derivative is undefined when t equals 2. t equals 2, again, not in the interval. Derivative's never 0, no critical numbers. I'm going to test my endpoints. h of 3 is 3, h of 5 is 5 thirds. 3 is bigger, 5 thirds is smaller. I have my maximum and my minimum. So let's do some trig. And g of x equals secant of x. I'm looking at the interval from negative pi over 6 to pi over 3. If you need to, consult a graph of secant and make sure that we're continuous on, on that domain, that everything should be good. Now my derivative, the g prime of x, is secant of x times tangent of x. And secant is 1 over cosine of x. Tangent is sine over cosine. So I might think of this Instead of secant of x, tangent of x, I might think of it as sine of x over cosine squared of x. I know that the derivative is undefined when cosine is 0. Well, when is cosine 0? Cosine is 0 at pi over 2, at 3 pi over 2, at the negative corresponding ones, all the odd values of pi over 2. So pi over 2, and then add values of pi. But these are not in our interval. None of those are. So the derivative is 0 when my numerator is 0. I know that sine of x equals 0 at x equals 0 for this interval. So I only have one critical number, x equals 0. To find the maximum and the minimum, the relative and absolute extrema, excuse me, the absolute extrema on a closed interval, I'll now evaluate g of negative pi over 6. That's secant of negative pi over 6, which is approximately 1.15. G of 0, our critical number of 0, where the numerator is 0. The secant of 0 is 1. G of pi over 3, that's the secant of pi over 3. I know that cosine of pi over 3 is a half, so secant of pi over 3 must be 2. Out of all three of these values, which is the largest? 2, that's my maximum. Out of the remaining values, which one is smallest? 1, this will be my minimum. That's it. Extreme. Uh, extrema on an interval. Remember, there is a separate video on critical numbers if you want to know more about those. Thanks for listening.